and welcome to this video where I'll be talking about creating the data structure to store data using QGIS. So in a previous video, I talked about creating the schema for your project. So which tables, which attributes you will need in your project. So in this lecture, I will be going a bit further and looking at how to store this schema on a database using QGIS. This is only, let's say, one of many operations um, relating to how to manage your geospatial database. So in an earlier video, we talked about how to importing a subset of an existing data set. We um, have this, talked about how to define and document your project data, so this schema I talked about it. And this video, we'll be talking about creating the structure of the data. So, but just to remind you that this is not only for QGIS. These structures are not in QGIS, but in some database that QGIS can access. So that means that this is also something that will be used in web-based applications or for sensors or for mobile data collection. There'll be another video on um, creating and modifying data. So once the structure is created, we can start putting data in it. I'll be demonstrating how to use an aerial photograph or a scan historical map, whatever, as a background or backdrop to create your data. Um, and finally, there are lots of other ways of modifying your project's geospatial database transforming it, resampling it, simplifying it, reprojecting, doing lots and lots of stuff that I will not cover in any videos I've planned, but yeah, more, more or less. So this video was on our structure, creating the structure. It's important that you understand that there's not anything QGIS as such, um, QGIS can open, read, write different data formats. And uh, depending on which data format you choose, you will have different possibilities in how to store your data. So the ones that I'll be talking about is the Geo package, which is really a SQL Lite database saying that if you're using some other software to access in QGIS, so I use DB to access my data outside QGIS, and now it's a SQL Lite database. There's a scratch layer, so I don't really use it that often, but there is something that you can create temporary and it will disappear when the QGIS project closes, but it's there can be useful for doing a quick extraction. But most of it, I almost always regret using it. I think, ah, why didn't I just save it on my hard drive so I could use it again later. And um, then there's Postgres, which is a multi-user um, enterprise level database for storing data in it. So the difference between Postgres and GeoPackages. GeoPackages is your local, on your hard drive, USB stick you can take it with you. And basically only one person can edit the data at a time. Multiple users can read it, but only one can edit. How was it gets a bit iffy. Um, Postgres, on the other hand, something that runs on a server, different from, typically different from your computer that runs QGIS, and it is designed to work with multiple users, multiple people editing data at the same time, having data coming in from different data sources, such as devices or whatever. So there's some different things that you might want to, um, to look at. Typically, 99% of the time, people use Geo packets in small projects. If you're working in a large organization, you will be using Postgres. 
when we look at the geometry types, remember we have it's a basic types, points, lines, and polygons. Um, then there are multi points, multi lines, multi polygons, um, which basically are several polygons or several points. So Denmark consists of many islands, so it will be difficult to represent Denmark as one polygon. Therefore, if you want to have a data storage or table of Denmark, you'll be needing to use a multi polygon. And um, there's also these that are called curved. Um, you, it's a, it, it, they are okay. Um, it, the thing is that in general, a polygon or line or point are vertexes of points that are connected by a lot straight line segments. The ones that are called curves allows you to curve the line between the points. Um, it can be used to make nicer geometry on less points, but also there's lots of operations that will not work on them. So it's only if you know what you want to do with them and you need it, then you would probably want to um, to use these. Um, multi surfaces, I must admit, no idea. Um, I checked the documentation. The only thing you can do is you can check if a point is on the surface. Um, and a Google only results is people say, hey, this gives errors. So probably not something I can recommend. At the moment, I will probably become cleverer on this point later in years to come. Whatever geometry type you choose to work with, um, you need to create a coordinate reference system. So something that connects the coordinates stored in your data store or locations on the surface of the Earth. Really, really short. I have a detailed video on this. Um, what really, really short story is that our there are two types that are geographic and they are projected coordinate systems. So a geographic coordinate system is a latitude and longitude. So it is something that is really good for global data, for data of large regions. It's also what you will typically get from your GPS. And the only thing they have to relate to is which shape, what is the earth shape. Um, Projected coordinate systems work on a flattened earth. So a, they are cartesian, so they have a 90 degrees angle of two axes. They, um, they have, are easier to work with doing calculations of areas and lengths and so on. And of course, typically the output, the map is also going to be flat. So they also have a role in how to depict your data. There are literally thousands of these different coordinate reference systems, and they all have different purposes. And in QGIS, it's a wee bit overwhelming, and many of them look exactly the same because QGIS does not have all the details on them in its display. But typically, I would say there are three that types that you need to use. So a global one, and that's almost always VGS 84. So that's also what is in GPS coordinate systems. So and you get from a GPS receiver. Um, then you'll probably have some continental, something that covers a large area, but is, or is a projector coordinate system. And in Europe, we often use this one. This is a Lambert as mutual equal area. So it's a way that areas of the same physical size also have the same size on the map. That's one we typically use in European mapping. And then in Denmark, we will typically use a UTM zone. Um, 
And over here we have what we call the ESPG, that is a European Petroleum Survey Group. Anyway, an organization that once upon a time invented some coding numbers. These numbers are typically what you remember and see in the different documentations. So these three numbers, if you're working in Denmark, are probably really useful. Coming back to this side here, you can see that VGS has only this part and that's an earth shape. These two share the same earth shape, but different ways of flattening. So there's lots, and um, as I said, I have a video on all of these aspects of a coordinate reference system. One thing you just have to remember at um, QGIS from, I don't know which, the couple of latest versions have had come with a little warning when you choose them, most of them at least. And you might get, oh, dear me, me, what is it saying? And if you mouse over it, it will say, oh, remember that the position, and in this case, in the, this coordinate system here, it will give me a position of 0 0.1 meter. And that's because of continental drift and lots of other strange things. And normally we will just say, yeah, that's fine. But it is a bit of a big warning for a less of a problem because if you're doing detailed mappings where these sub 10 centimeter things have an importance, you will probably also know more about coordinate reference systems. So don't get a, you know, don't get alarmed. It's, it's there and just tells you that, well, there's a limiting in position and no sweat. When we look at the attribute data types, um, we, um, we have our numbers and numbers come in two flavors. So we have uh, integers, which are whole numbers, and decimals with bits of point, so floating point decimals or real numbers, if you wish. Um, when we start looking at the different types of data storage, they will come in lots of different shapes and sizes, depending on how big numbers, how much precision. And so on. we'll return to that topic in a moment. Then there's a type of number, um, booleans, true or false, or basically zero or one. So that's a, a really small number, uh, but we use them as true or false. Then we have text or strings, which is a string of characters or text. Um, once upon a time, you always had to specify what was the maximum length. And then some implementations, you still have to do that. So you say, okay, how many characters that will there at a maximum be in this attribute? Um, most databases today implement that you can have variable length of your text strings, and that works fine without it eating up all your hard drive. Time and time date um, are also really common data types. Blobs, binary large objects, typically pictures, video recordings, things that the software itself is ignorant of. It's just something that it is storing and then something else must decide what to do about it. And then we have structural data, typically something called JSON, which is something where you can have an object, me, and it have a, has an extra attribute called name, which is Esbon, and an age. So something that is has a structure and it has properties in that structure. Um, very specialized, probably try to avoid it. If we uh, look at how they implemented in the geo packages, so they are different. While the geometry types basically are the same in the scratch layer, the geo package, and in Postgres, the attribute types are very different, as you can see here. So we have the scratch there, the geo package, and um, the Postgres. If um, we look at text, so that again here, you can see that the Postgres has a lot of different um, types. It has a fixed length and a limited and an unlimited. 
um, and case insensitive stuff. There's some different variants you can work with in Postgres. Our numbers, again, we have in scratch layers and uh, only our integer and decimal. In the geo package, uh, integers and a bit larger integers. So it's really just a question about how many, how large or small numbers can you have represented. In uh, Postgres, again, we have even more different types. So we have a one that's a smaller than the one we have in the geo package, and then the two that we have in the geo package. And again, there, there are variations over the decimal. Again, they're mainly related to how many decimal points. So really the question is there that you can have a specific precision, so a num maximum number of decimal points or really maximum size. So they're a bit different decimal, but there you can see they are basically just a question about how many bytes you use. And to be quite honest, I would always use a integer, so a 64 bit, and I will always use a double as my um, a decimal number. But that's, you know, whatever. Um, I don't normally have data sets that are that large or so specialized, so I have to worry about this. We have our Boolean, so true false. We have different implementations of time and date and time date combined um, and we have some some history thing which is well that's a bit strange to put in there well it is a type of of of, um, of time then we have um, a oh that thing I think map is doing something different never mind that um Finally, large objects, so blobs, in all implementations, um, arrays or complex. So these are again in the geopacks. We have the, the JSON string. In the scratch layer, we have a, something they call map, which is basically a JSON string. And then they have arrays or lists of, um, of numbers. Um, so if you have a list of words or a list of numbers in the Postgres, we can have the same lists and then we have a JSON and then we have a binary JSON, which is basically just a JSON, but optimized for quicker search. So it's it's um, basically the same, those two. So probably, yeah, they are our specialized purposes. So. You probably won't start out using them. And the thing is that as long as you stick with text, numbers, booleans, and dates, you can probably make some nice filters and subsetting without too much problem. Soon as you go into these more complex structures, you'll probably find that try that doing any filtering on it will become complex and you will really need to be wanting to do it before you start on that. Um, so that was for the theory part. If you now look at how it works in QGIS, um, we can start with the scratch layers. So scratch layers are available from up in the menu under layer, and then you can say create layer, and you can do a new temporary scratch layer. And the dialog box goes like this. So you have, give a layer a name, choose the geometry as I showed before. So I just have to choose something. Choose your coordinate reference system. This drop down is a wee bit annoying because it's those that you've used earlier. So you probably, the first time you start, you'll only have one here. If you go to this globe with a plus on it or whatever it is, um, then you have a more advanced where you can type in 
if you know that it is something to do with Lambert as a modal equal area, you can type that and it will filter not only your known ones, but also all of these down here. It will filter based on that text. So until you get some of into using different ones, you'll have to pick them up out in this part of the dialog box. And then once you have done that the first time, then they will appear up in this favorite or whatever recently used part of it. So you choose a type. I'm going to work, use a Danish one. And you can see it shows which area of the earth it is suitable for. So Denmark, Europe, world. Gives it a warning. I mouse over it. And it says, oh dear, dear, remember that there's a limited position and blah, blah, blah. That's fine. And then comes all the different attributes, name, test, and you'll get choose your string, your integer, and those are sort of showed before. Choose something, press add to list, and you're done. Good. So, if you uh, and of course you could have added more before I said it finished done. For the Postgres and Geo package, the procedure is more or less the same. Um, you but here I would you can do it from the same place up layer, add layer, and then you could so create layer, geo package layer. Um, but I must admit, I personally prefer to use the browser panel here. So I'll put, find my Geo database or create one in a folder. Right click, say new Geo package. Um, in the Geo package, you can right click and say new table. So, and in the table, you can give it a name, test, table. You choose the add field, give that. Test attribute, choose the data type, as I showed in the slides. If it is the one that has a limitation, you can put a limitation on it there as a string. Um, or just leave it. The geometry down here, point, multipoint, whatever. And again, exactly the same for the coordinate system. Add a new attribute. to consider its type um so it is and so on say so, okay that's fine and that's it for the first crest it's exactly the same first crest of course they're a bit more complex in their structure so you'll have to find a database and that's fine there's a video um, or I'm working on a video about how to work in um, large organizations or how to set up a multi-user environment with a um, Postgres. So I'll cover that and so, yeah. subscribe to the channel and you'll get notified about that. Um, anyway, choose your database, right click on it, new table, um, and exactly the same dialog box as for the geo package the only difference is um that's a schema and when you add your types you have a larger number of types to choose from so the the geo package and the postgres use more or less the same dialog box to uh, to enter the data and the geo package has this a little more limited set of attribute types that you can use compared to postgres but uh, most situations um the geo package is fine so um basically that was all for this video um i hope you liked it and the next video in this video series here 
I'll be talking about putting data into this data structure that it is created. So the process is think about your structure, document your schema, which tables, which attributes you want, create the structure in a due database or in some yeah, problems. Due database is also a name for something used in ArcGIS, but using a due package or a Postgres or a temporary scratch layer. Create the structure and then start editing the data, which is in the next video. So hope you liked it. Hope to see you in another video. Bye.